Thursday, June 11th uh, at 6.20 p.m. As a preliminary matter, uh, <clears throat> permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present. Can you hear me, Ms. Exton? Here. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Ms. Cardin? Yes, I was sorry, I'm muted. Here, I'm here. Okay, Dr. Alston Ampey. Here. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Here. Mr. Hayner. Here. Ms. Morgan. Here. And I am here uh, as the chair of the committee. Um, members, when I call your name, you've affirmed, uh, you have uh, affirmative uh, responded. Uh, the open meeting. Wise. We are now turning the first item on the agenda will be the election of the chair. Before we do so, permit to cover some ground rules. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, chair will go down the list of members uh, and please refrain from, please remember to mute your phone or computer. Please remember to speak clearly for any response. Please wait till the chair leads the floor, yields the floor to you. Members wish to engage in the colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair. Um, okay, the first item on the agenda is the election of a chair of the Arlington School Committee. Uh, nominations, please. I nominate Mr. Hayner. I nominate Jane Morgan for chair. I second the nomination. Okay, the nomination of Jane Morgan has been made and seconded. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, roll call vote on the uh, election of Jane Morgan to chair. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote yes, that's a unanimous vote, seven nothing. Now we enter into the uh, nomination of the Office of Vice Chair, uh, who'd like to make a nomination. Uh, Mr. Cardin? I nominate uh, Bill Hayner as vice chair. Who seconds that? I second it. Okay, uh, motion by, made by Mr. Cardin, second by Mr. Thielman. Uh, any other nominations? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative seven nothing vote. Uh, nominations for the office of secretary. I nominate Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I will second Mr. that. Okay, motion and second in motion by Mr. Thielman, second by uh, Mr. Hayner. Any other nominations? Seeing none, roll call vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. Next order of business will be to approve the committee and liaison assignments 
as presented. Uh, motion by uh, Ms. Morgan, second by uh, Mr. Hayner. Uh, uh, roll call, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. Next, uh, I would like to hear a motion to authorize the chair to say uh, sign the payroll warrant. So move. Motion move. By, hmm? Motion I'll second by Bill's motion. Bill made the second. motion. I'll second it. Who, who made the motion? Bill. I second it. Uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Thielman. Any discussion? Hearing none. Roll call. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. Uh, now, per policy BDA, the standards and norms of the Arlington School Committee, uh, normally we will do this by signing, but I will do a roll call vote uh, in acceptance of policy BDA-E, uh, which is our tradition. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I affirm uh, uh, policy BDA-E, the standards and norms of the Arlington School Committee. Uh, motion to adjourn. So move. By second. Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Thielman. Roll call. Ms. Exton? Yes. Ms. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. We are adjourned. See you in the next meeting. Thank you very much. So just in case anybody, we have a couple of attendees. So this was the Zoom link for the organizational meeting. And now we need to move to the Zoom. We're going to a second meeting, which seems kind of weird, but that's just how it's done. So we're going to go to a new Zoom link and you'll need to log in through the 6.30 PM meeting link. Welcome to the uh, second, well, the regular school committee meeting of uh, Thursday, June 11th, 2020. I'm gonna start um, by reading the um, script for remotely conducted open meetings. Permit me first to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. So members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And staff, let's do the same thing. Um, Dr. Bodie? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Mr. Spiegel? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mason? Yes. And Ms. Elmer? Yes. All right. Um, so good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of May 12, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus, in order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such, unless such participation is required by law. Um, this meeting uh, will feature uh, public comment by, um, by advanced sign up or by email. Um, for this meeting is uh, convening by Zoom uh, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. 
for Zoom meetings, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and uh, take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive sessions materials, are available in the Novus agenda dashboard. We recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted in, noted, in Novus unless I note otherwise. Um, so we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the list of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If we're not going to do that part. Um, if members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, so the first item on the agenda is public comment. So um, my understanding was, Ms. Fitzgerald, that we didn't receive anything over email and nobody requested to speak. Is that correct? That is correct. OK. So, and I see Dr. McNeil has joined us. I just want to make sure that um, in our attendance that he can hear us and he is able to speak. Dr. McNeil, can you let us know that you are here? I am here. Sorry Great. for the, my tardiness. It was, I was having some technical difficulties. We are happy to see you and all you missed was reading the script. So we're doing great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on from public comment, um, the first item, the second item on the agenda is um, a welcome that I just wanted to do. This is um, my first meeting as Arlington School Committee Chair. I was elected about five minutes ago. Um, I'm pleased to be serving with my Vice Chair, Mr. Hayner, and our Secretary, Mr. Schlichtman. Um, I would like to welcome Ms. Liz Exton to the School Committee and to welcome back Mr. Hayner and Mr. Schlichtman. Thank you to the voters of Arlington for your unprecedented participation in our local election last weekend. The seven of us members of this committee serve at your will and your participation is appreciated. This is our first school committee meeting since the murder of George Floyd by a police officer resulting in a public reckoning both nationally and here in Arlington over systemic racism and black people's long-standing catastrophic interactions with law enforcement. Issues around racism, including student achievement, discipline, representation, and course materials have been and must continue to be discussed at the school committee level here in our meetings, and I welcome increased interest and engagement from the community. Our schools are not immune, and we must work together to improve both our data and our student experiences. Um, a few housekeep one housekeeping item and um, a thank you. Um, so uh, tonight, Dr. Allison Ampey and Mr. Cardin need to step out for a couple of times, uh, just once each respectively, to attend to family obligations. Um, and Dr. Allison Ampey plans to follow along by phone, but will not be available on video during that time. Um, I was also um, wanted to thank Joanna, Paul, the APD, and the AFD for their help with the class of 2020 graduation caravan. I heard from a couple of parents who um, were, um, were grateful, and so are we, and so I wanted to make sure to thank them publicly. So um, the next item on the agenda, this is a, a holdover from um, sort of our last session. So um, one of the school committee's responsibilities is to bring forward um, nominations of people to serve on various town commissions and committees. Um, and as part of that, the community relations subcommittee um, went through a process of um, looking for somebody to assign to the Poet Laureate Selection Committee. Um, and the chair of the community relations subcommittee up until today um, was Ms. Seuss. 
And um, since she is no longer a member of the school committee, I um, wanted to just take a minute to uh, introduce our nominee. Um, Mr. Stuart Deck is a, a teacher, a math interventionist at the Stratton School, um, teaches elementary students, full disclosure, he, um, he teaches my kids and um, we're, we're really lucky to have him. And um, I'm delighted that he is interested in and willing to serve on the Poet Laureate Selection Committee. So um, Mr. Deck, are you able to give the committee um, a couple of minutes of, or let, tell us a little bit about yourself so that we can vote on your appointment? Sure. Start that up. Um, hi, I'm happy to be here and, and very excited to be here. Uh, I moved to Massachusetts about 28 years ago this summer. Uh, moved here with a degree in English and anticipated using that degree in English in publishing, writing in some form. Uh, we moved to Arlington 24 years ago and I was a feature writer for magazines. I wrote for uh, several technology magazines um, and wrote features and news for several years for technology magazines. About eight years ago, um, I became part of the Stratton Elementary School math support team and uh, have been a math interventionist at the Stratton Elementary School for eight years, working with kids from kindergarten through, uh, through fifth grade um, helping to identify kids who are having some math challenges and uh, working with my intervention colleagues to come up with programs and ways to, to connect with the kids, identify them, and uh, build them up so that they can um, be part of their math classrooms and, and really dig into the math learning that the rest of the school is doing. I've been going to the Stratton Elementary School, not every day, but many days for about 17 years. Um, we have two sons who started at the Stratton Elementary School, are just now finishing their college semesters at home. Uh, but I've been, I've been walking to the Stratton Elementary School and near the Stratton Elementary School for about 17 years since the first one started there in kindergarten. And I still go there just about every day. That's, that's how I got from, from with an English degree to Massachusetts to um, working in the math department at Stratton Elementary School. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're excited to have you here. Um, so I'm looking for a motion for to appoint uh, Mr. Deck to the Poet Laureate Screening Committee. I move that uh, Stuart Deck be the school committee's member to Arlington Poet Laureate Committee. I'll second that. Okay, so we need, I assume we need to do this by roll call vote because we have to do them all. So Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I'm also a yes. So that's a seven nothing vote. Thank you, Mr. Deck. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the remote learning plan update. So I'm gonna turn this over to you, Dr. Bodie, and I don't know who else you have who wants to speak to this. You're on mute. Thank you. I don't know which number of Zoom meeting this is today, so you should be used to this after all these uh, weeks. Um, let me begin by reminding you that in the part of Novus where the superintendent's report is, the chart that I spoke about last week has been put together uh, by K2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and well, Audison, and then the, the high school. 
So you can see what the participation levels have been since May 4th over a three week period. And, and I would have to say that they're, they're actually uh, pretty good. Um, obviously we would love to see 100% participation, but having percents up in the 80% um, for turning in work at the secondary level and the, the number at the secondary level for being in uh, Google Hangout is less than the, the elementary school. What I can tell you from meetings that we've had in the last week, that, the, that this, these percents represent what is continuing now through the end of the year. One of the things that we are going to be following up with, in fact, uh, we have it almost ready to go, is a, a parent survey, that will likely go out sometime later tomorrow, um, asking parents to just to give us a, some feedback on the last few weeks since May 4th, the phase three part of uh, school closure, and also be looking at and some questions about the opening in the fall. But uh, the report is there uh, by these different grade levels. What I want to actually focus on a little bit more right now is we did a student survey. Pull that data up. Um, the, the survey is still not closed. It's open until tomorrow. And we did have a little bit of a glitch that the um, survey didn't get out to the sixth grade students. So uh, th that has been remedied and we're getting a lot of data in. But I thought you'd find it interesting uh, some of the uh, data that we have already. This was sent to our sixth through 12th grade students. And at this point, there are 600, at least when we put this report together, <laughs> Dr. McNeil did, 609 respondents. Um, the highest respondents were from the high school and OMS. Um, I suspect that by tomorrow, this data will, will shift a bit. There were 162 students out of the 609, and putting the 609 in perspective, we have a little over 3,000 secondary students. That 162 of the students prefer to attend a Google Meet and listen to their teacher explain a, uh, a lesson. However, 217 students prefer to watch a video when it's convenient. What is, I thought, pretty good news is that we have nearly 60% of our students report that they spend three and a half hours completing assignments every day. And uh, there are uh, students, well, it's broke, we can, we can, when we give this report to you, you'll be able to see it broken out by the different levels. But basically, this is 59.4% of all the students that were in the survey. Nearly 45% of the students who are not participating in online learning identify that the fact that the assignments, the reason for that is the assignments do not count for a grade. So 136 of the respondents of the, two, of the 609 said that that was the issue. And that was something that we had uh, as feedback from an earlier survey that the issue of having accountability, having a grade is a, is a motivator for students to be, participate. So we will give you the, uh, the finished uh, survey results um, once the survey closes and, and send it to you um, over the next two weeks or make sure it's in your packet for uh, the next school committee meeting. In addition to the parent survey that we are planning to send out, um, we are also going to be sending a staff survey as well. One of the uh, most uh, the most frequently asked question by teachers as well as parents, is what is going to happen next year? I think everybody at this point is now focused on the fact that school is gonna close next week. Um, and teachers have been very busy giving feedback and uh, to students and students making up the work they need to make up in order to, to have their either their audit or their meeting expectations. But the, the issue is, on everybody's mind, is how are we going to begin next year? 
And right now there's still some uncertainty. There has been some hints from the Department of Education that they are leaning toward a hybrid model in which um, some students are in school one day or one week and then the other group of students in the class come the, the alternate um, day or week. The Department of Education has promised that by next week, by the 17th, we'll have um, more, more guidelines. In the meantime, we have, we have working groups that have been established in virtually all the different areas that we need to look at, whether it's curriculum, safety, transportation, food service, um, certainly, as I said, curriculum. And those committees have already begun working. Uh, we're going to be including teacher voice in many of these, many of these committees. Um, and I expect that the committees will be working over the summer. I think it's, it's difficult at this point to um, put a lot of energy into one of the possible three options that we had, which was we were going to have full uh, attendance, a regular opening of the school year, hybrid or remote. But what I can say is that we're going to be looking at the last two the most, particularly um, the hybrid and the remote, uh, the remote from the point of view of um, how would a school day look next year if it was remote? We, we, we do know that when next year comes, uh, we're not going to have the same kind of asynchronous um, learning experiences we have right now. There will be much more synchronous. It does not mean that there would not be asynchronous, uh, where there could be videos that we want students to look at and then come back and, and, and discuss. So there's going to be certainly some of that. And one of the, there's two groups right now that are, um, are study groups that have been looking at synchronous learning at the elementary and the secondary level. And we are asking as many of those people as are able to remain through the summer working on this because I think the, the experience they've had, the research that's gone on, um, is going to be invaluable in terms of designing what this would look like on a, on a daily basis. The remote piece is going to be important because uh, we don't know at any time whether a school or the whole district would have to shift into remote. So we want to make sure that we have a, 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 pro, uh, a plan in place. We also may have a remote learning option for parents. We understand that there probably will be some parents that, that are, for a lot of concerns around safety, may not want their children to return in the fall. And that's actually one of the things that we're trying to determine in this, um, this survey that we're gonna do is to get us something of an idea about that. But we are going to spend a fair amount of time actually designing what that would look like for the fall. In addition to that, if we have to have, uh, we're going to have a hybrid what would that look like? What would it look like in our classrooms? What would it mean for lunch? What would it mean for after school programming? So there's just a, a myriad of things that we have to um, entertain. But I think it's gonna be very helpful for our district as well as all the districts in the state to have a little bit clearer guidance um, of what our suggested guidelines and what are going to be mandatory elements of a program next year. So by the time we meet in two weeks, I think that I will be able to give you much more insight into all of that than I can, can this evening. One, uh, one thing that we did not discuss at the last meeting was what the elementary progress report was going to look like uh, for this time period. We had talked about the high school having the audit, no, um, no audit, um, we talked about the three uh, designations at the middle school, but what was decided over the last um, couple of weeks was that the elementary progress report was going to was really going to be more of a narrative letter to parents, and it's going to consist of three parts: sort of a broad view of the school year uh, from the point of view of the teacher in terms of the progress of um, the student, as well as what some reflections about the, the learning during this remote time, and then as well as 
some, some suggestions for what they can do over the summer to prepare for the next school year. So all the letters will have those components in it. And uh, we expect that those will be going out to parents um, um, right, right as school closes. So um, one of the things that's gone on this week and it's continuing um, into next week is that all of, the, all of the schools have made some plans for how student um, work and belongings can be picked up um, at each school. And um, some people who planned today sort of got very wet as they did. I think Stratton was one of the schools that had one of the pickups today. And it was very well organized as they are at all the schools. And I think one of the things that nice about this experience is that uh, the, ch the children are coming with parents to pick up materials and seeing their teachers, albeit the teachers in masks, but they're still seeing their teachers. So that's been going on. As another, um, another thing that is, is happening in all of our elementary schools is having uh, virtual meetings with kindergarten parents. Normally we would have kindergarten parents coming into our schools uh, for an orientation and then they would come another time for to, to meet the teachers to get a tour of the classrooms and so instead of that second part uh, the schools have a, a virtual uh, look at the different schools kindergarten teachers have been part of this as well so the third aspect of usually the last couple of years is having kindergarten screening um, which is a state mandated process and that is going to be deferred to the fall, which, which in Arlington we did for many years. We just had moved it back in recent years, but uh, that will be planned. And, and actually how it will be conducted will be planned over the summer because uh, some of it may actually be done virtually. That has yet to be decided as well. So that is sort of a, a, an update on activities in the district since the last time we met. I don't know if you have any questions before we move into talking about uh, summer programming. Yeah, let's do a round of questions or comments from people. Um, so, uh, Ms. Exton. Um, sure, thank you. Um, thanks for this update. I'm wondering with the data of the participation, um, what strategies were teachers using to increase participation and were you seeing a change based on on those strategies I don't know if I can speak that speak to that that's one of the things we want to get at actually out of the the survey that we do and I can certainly give you some feedback on that the next time we meet uh, because whatever those strategies are uh, those are ones that we certainly want to um, replicate in any kind of programming that we go forward with. I will say that um, the broad anecdotal is that the, the, the number of students that at the elementary level participate more in these. And part of it is they want to see their friends, they want to see their teacher, and they don't really have other mechanisms for that level of connection other than maybe their neighborhood or you know, if they, if they have their own uh, Facebook. But at the secondary level, that's not the motivator to come into a Google Classroom necessarily because they have other means of staying in contact. I think that some of the participation levels have been highest when there's been discussions, um, discussion on current events, there's been um, opportunities in some classes for questions but then again if students don't have a question they feel that the purpose of the hangout is for questions they may not come to it so we're gonna we're gonna dig in a little bit more to that because I think it's a great question that we uh, we want to take a look at thank you just one one more um, sort of along the same lines um, I'm curious um, just thinking about the teachers that are piloting the synchronous learning are they seeing higher levels of participation in those classes than, than teachers who are doing more of a hangout at meet up as opposed to some teaching? That's a great question. Can I defer that question to Dr. McNeil because he actually is um, leading these two study groups 
uh, the elementary and the secondary, and I know they've had discussions about this. Dr. McNeil? Yes, hi. So I think at the elementary level, as uh, Dr. Bodhi alluded to, the participation is, is high. I think that the one thing that we want to focus on is the secondary level. And as the students indicated in the survey, they're talking about whether or not the work is required and it's going to um, uh, impact their grade. So I think once we shift to the fall, I, I'm going to, I think that we're going to have uh, more participation in the online learning. Um, at the elementary level, uh, we've been really uh, focusing on instructional strategies, not so much the motivation of you know, to get students uh, to participate. Because like I said before, I think at the elementary level, the participation is high. Um, but some of the things that we have been discussing is how we're using the online tools. Uh, well, let me back up a second. We want to, we want to, uh, fo we're focusing on what online tools we want to invest in that will increase engagement with online learning. So teachers have been uh, showcasing uh, the various synchronous uh, lessons that they've been doing with students. We've been sharing best practice. We's also, we also have been sharing uh, asynchronous videos that they've been doing uh, that are, you know, that they've done in order to increase engagement, making them more entertaining. And then also, um, we've been talking about the use of the online tools and how they're integrating, integrating those online tools into their instruction. So I can't, I think there's a myriad of reasons that may, um, impact student motivation to participate, but at the elementary level, I think we have a very high participation rate to begin with. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, uh, that's not really something, I mean, we are talking about it, but I can't pinpoint one reason that's going to, I can uh, definitively say that this is a reason that is, um, that is uh, motivating students to participate at the elementary level. We've been talking about a lot of different things that they've been doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Mr. Cardin, I'm going to take Dr. Allison Ampey out of order just because I happen to know what her schedule looks like. So I'm going to take her questions or comments before you, and then I will come back to you. So, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have to turn into a token in a moment. Um, I appreciate Ms. Exton's question. Um, I wonder, Dr. Bodie, can you talk about why you're emphasizing hybrid and remote learning options as opposed to in, in person? Because I know a lot of parents feel they really would like the kids to go back. I mean, everyone wants their kids to be safe, but people feel like this isn't working so well and they feel like school will work better if the kids are in classrooms. I agree that that's the case. Where the, the hybrid came from is uh, this has been discussed at the state level and it comes from um, wanting to have certain safety distances within the school classroom. Uh, a week ago, the Department of Education sent out a, a list of supplies the schools should be thinking about purchasing now in, in preparation for the year. As just an aside on that particular issue, we've we had already been doing that, and we upped some of our orders after seeing that list. But in that uh, memo, also talked about having desks at six feet apart in our classrooms. And if you're going to have to, that's going to have to be a safety requirement. There's no way that you have all of the students in the classroom at the same time. Um, there's been discussion in, in um, calls about this particular model. The level of detail and the disruption that it would cause would be fairly significant. But are we planning as that as a possibility? Uh, if that becomes a requirement of the state, then yes, that's what we would do. If there is some level of choice in this and parents um, understand the risks of returning to school when we perhaps don't have that kind of ratio of child to space in a classroom. That might be something that we talk about and we talk about certainly with the committee as well. So that's where it came from as it really, it really began 
at the state level uh, of thinking about that as a possibility. Okay, so just to reiterate, it's it's not because Arlington has any strong desire to not have students in classrooms, it's because we're doing what's di dictated by what's being prescribed by the state. Um, I, I'm just trying to make sure that people That this is not an Arlington idea. It is not an Arlington idea. Yeah. Um, in fact, I would, I would prefer that we have a regular opening with as many safety precautions as we could have. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I do understand the point of view of the Department of Public Health that they want to maintain um, enough enough safety in our schools that we do not have another uh, a major outbreak of COVID in the fall as well. So I think that there's a lot yet to be discussed and learned about this as to what the options will be and how this would be implemented in Arlington. Uh, but uh, in fact, there's going to be, uh, as I said, guidelines coming out from the department next week. And I think that that we'll learn a lot more from that. We also, by the way, have been pulling materials from other states that are also considering this option as, as well. Okay, let me, I'm gonna ask one other quick question, which is my understanding from um, parents is that some of the software which we're using really at the elementary level really does not function well without functioning email addresses for the kids. And I'm just wondering again, what are what's our roadblock here how can we assuming we're going forward with these softwares how can we get rid of this roadblock and make it so that um, families can access the software more easily and, and just give the kids the email address well it's something that we can certainly take another look at um, this summer i i don't know why the email address would be a block to that um, in, K, in our K2, one of the things that we are really shifting more toward is a different platform, though we may still use Google Classroom as the link to it, um, is, the, is Seesaw. And it seems to be a lot more student friendly, giving students much more independence. Yeah. Another thing that we're gonna be looking at this summer to be perfectly um, transparent about this is really looking at Zoom because there are some features um, of Zoom that have not been adopted yet by uh, the Google Meet, Google Hangout, that would be potentially very helpful, particularly um, at the older grades in terms of being able to have different uh, working groups within a, a session. So we are looking at that. We'll, we'll certainly take another look at this issue as well. And I'd like to hear more. I think our IT department would like to hear more about why that is an impediment, but maybe we can do that at another time. Yeah, I, I think it depends on what platform you're using, and it may be um, if you're using an iPad and stuff that the email address becomes more important. Um, so mm -hmm. that's where, and I have to turn into a pumpkin now, so I'll be listening to you all. See you soon. Okay. Mr. Carden. Great. Uh, thanks for the update. Um, I, guess, I guess more of a, a comment than a, a question, two comments actually. One is that it would be great to get, that the summary you just gave was good, but it would be great to get that out as a communication to parents as soon as possible. Um, you know, there's a lot of rumors floating around. A couple of the principals have sort of said very briefly, we're considering these three different models, but there's a, a uniform message from you explaining you know why we're considering these three models that you have working groups already established that you're going to do a parent survey that there's going to be other opportunities to get the parent voice um, i think would be very helpful because um, the audience for this meeting is, is extremely limited and it gets translated in ways that may not be the best um, so that's just a, a request mm -hmm. um, and uh and, and again as part of part of that is as I said, you know, the, the parent voice, you mentioned the teacher voice as far as these working groups. I know you're doing the survey, but um, it also would be helpful as the model evolves to, to get parent voice involved 
So we may have a, you know, the state, we'll, we'll find out next week, the state may give us some flexibility on the hybrid model, whether to do day in, day out, or week in, week, week, in, wait, week out. And that's something obviously you want to talk to parents about because there may be some strong preferences about that. Um, there may be other issues that come up um, as you're developing, particularly the hybrid model, um, that it would be great to get some parent feedback. Again, not a full survey, but the principals, you know, they've, they've got their councils, they've got their PTOs. Um, they should be working with, with parents to get their voice into the process. So mm -hmm. not really questions, but those, those are my comments. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Thielman? I'm going to move on to Mr. Schlickman, and we'll come back to Mr. Thielman. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, aligned with uh, Dr. Allison Ampey's question, I'm just wondering uh, if we can get a further update on what we think we may need uh, to purchase or to have uh, that we don't have right now. Um, we have spent actually quite a bit of time on de determining exactly that. Um, we can certainly send you the memo from, from um, the state. We probably, you pro actually, I think I may have sent it. Um, Mr. Mason and I, as well as Sue Frankie, who is our uh, director of nursing, have actually spent a fair amount of time on this uh, in terms of what we need to purchase. But we can show you the, the spreadsheets because we keep track of all this in order that we can submit it uh, for uh, reimbursement. I'm also thinking in terms of uh, technology and instructional stuff that we wouldn't normally have uh, that, that we're looking to purchase uh, because obviously coming down the uh, line in this meeting is the budget discussion and, and that's going to be informative. Would you want me to talk a little bit about that right now to your question about the technology? Or do you want to wait? It's, 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 up, to, it's up to the chair. That's, that's, it, it, it's part of the budgetary stuff, so I wouldn't mind uh, waiting, but... Uh, Let's wait uh, until we get to the, the budget topic, if that's all right. Yeah. Okay. Did you have anything else, Mr. Schlickman? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman, we're coming back to you. Yeah, thanks. I do. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think to those who have asked, I've made my opinion clear, which is that I think we need to reopen the schools and I'd like to see our district <clears throat> advocate to um, Jeff Riley and the commissioner, the, uh, the, the state that there should be a uniform <clears throat> plan for the state, I think a, um, a possible solution is to, Matt, I understood what you're talking about, the different models. I think a possible solution is basically ultimately to give parents a choice. Um, they have the, they can, they can send their children um, <clears throat> and there's obviously some risk uh, that they have to accept, we all have to accept. And then uh, they can also, um, they can also learn remotely if we can set that up. Um, so I mean, my position is very clear. I think the best thing for the kids, I think the best, and I think that's what, that's where the decision has to be. I think the best thing for students is to go back to school. I think it's the best thing for families in terms of routine. Um, <clears throat> and it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. It's, it's impossible to keep <laughs> kids totally away from each other all day long. Uh, and I, I think setting unrealistic expectations is, uh, uh, Unreal is, is not, I think we've said, I think that, I think the, the memo from the commissioner sets unrealistic ex expectations for a school. Um, it's just not realistic to keep kids six feet apart. Uh, it's not realistic uh, to have a classroom set up the way he's designed it. And we're going to have to live with some imperfections and that's just part of life. Uh, and uh, so that's where I stand. I, <clears throat> um, one thing I want to ask uh, is <clears throat> um, it's taken some time to set up remote learning, and I'm wondering if there's enough time over the summer to um, order anything you're gonna need to order for remote learning in the fall, more cameras, more computers, more technology, get that set up to do trainings. I'm wondering if there's enough time between now and September to do that. Um, we've already ordered the technology. Okay. And we're getting uh, 
in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I can talk more about what the, what the decision was on that. Uh, in terms of, there are some things that we are still debating about in terms of the, the webcams and, and how and when we would use those. But to your, to your point about the, I, I've already expressed my opinion at the state level on this, but I will say that one of the things we also have to take into consideration too is um, our teaching staff and making sure that the environment that we have is also an environment which they can be safe as well, as well as the students in the school. And so it's, it's a dual consideration. Um, like for example, one of the things that we've already, I think we've put the order in already, but we're certainly, if we haven't, it's going in, is we're, we're getting these face shields that you've seen people wear in the hospital mm -hmm. as, an, as another source of protection. So that we've been trying to think about what is the best research, what does the best, what does that tell us in terms of what might be best to buy? So there's that whole safety piece of it, but then there's also the technology and we are planning in technology to make sure that we have um, computers for teachers that are going to meet their needs. And I think that the computers that we've had uh, have, have had a lot of limitations in terms of what teachers need to do. The Chromebooks are fine for students and they've been working quite well, but teachers have a different level of preparation that they have to have. And so actually, maybe I, I will mention this at this point, and I won't go too deeply into it, but we, as you know, we have a technology plan and we have a, we have a, a plan uh, uh, replacement schedule. We've decided to think about it a little bit differently and do give teachers an upgraded computer for next year uh, and we're, we chose the MacBook Air. And I let people know that we have to figure out the distribution piece of it, but we're gonna take the, the Chromebooks that teachers have back and, and wipe them and you know, have them prepared uh, to supplement our Chromebook that we have in the school. I think we have to buy some, I know we have to buy some additional Chromebooks, but we can't have students sharing Chromebooks next year. And so that's been part of our planning as well. And we knew we had to get out there in order now so that we have these in, play, in place and we can get, it's not like you get the computer and they're all ready to go. There's lots of IT has to do to get a computer ready for distribution. So uh, we have been doing that. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the budget piece of it because it relates to FY20 money. Okay, I don't want to, I don't want to get to the, the um, other question is, I'm assuming um, that we're going to begin a conversation uh, with the AEA um, and, 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 and uh, negotiations of some sort this summer um, about remote learning next fall. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what the timeline is for that. Well, we meet regularly. In fact, we're meeting tomorrow. We meet met last Friday. We meet next Friday. So we, we're in constant communication about all of this. And uh, if there's some things that we need, um, we feel that it's important to create an MOA about, we will. But we certainly, this is a very collaborative process that we're going through, and it needs to be. No. Um, and I really welcome uh, all of the, the thinking of our teachers and through the leadership. And, and to Mr. Cardin's point about parent voice, we have the mechanism in place. We have school councils to you know, have some of these, you know, getting, getting voices into this process. But it is, you know, right now we're almost at the end of, we're in the middle of June and we have close to three months, not quite, but we have close to three months because fortunately this year, and I say fortunately, Labor Day is late because it just gives us a little bit more time. Do you, do you, I mean, I guess my question is, uh, do you anticipate a formal MOA with the AEA that we would have to weigh in on and approve? Um, I, I don't know yet. Um, okay. I don't know if Mr. Levy wants to, to say any comments about that. He is the current president of the AEA. I don't want to get into negotiations here. I just want to know the, I just want to know the process. That's it. I think it's 
too early to tell until we get more state guidance. Okay. We're back next year. It's not necessary. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to understand that. Thank you. Thanks for calling me, Jan. I'm sorry I was there. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Uh, first off, a little political statement. Uh, once again, the Department of Education shows they don't have any educator on the board to ground them in uh, their uh, mandates they send out. The idea of telling classrooms they're going to have uh, desks six feet apart is making the assumption that students sit at their desk all year. We stopped doing that 50 years ago. That being said, I'd like to suggest a couple of things for you to consider that if we have a hybrid with students, a portion of students coming in, set up a video camera so that the rest of the class that is not in the classroom at that time can participate in what's going on and rotate the students that choose to come to school in that class. The teachers may be able to keep a semblance of a regular curriculum going forward. Um, there's your hybrid of both remote and such. The other part is that if we end up with a one week on, one week off, or every other day, I'd like you to, and this just adds to your burden, to look at the parents that have multiple graded children so that one of their children is not in school while the other child is out of school on the multiple day or multiple week. It's a consideration, it adds to your work, but uh, it's, it's something that several parents have already talked to me about, that if we're going to be in and out in different times, and um, I applaud you and I applaud the staff for all that you've done to maintain uh, the safety of the children. Uh, I was fortunate to participate in uh, three virtual mock town meetings with teachers from Stratton, and the three teachers work way beyond what my expectation was, and the kids were all involved. We had, I think, 90% participation in all three classes. So thank you. Thanks, thanks for uh, doing the, the mock town meeting with them. Um, so my comments are um, on a couple of the things. I'm going to stick to what was presented tonight. The, um, you know, the survey I think is interesting. Um, I don't, I don't really know. I'm not, because we were read the data, I, it's confusing for me. It sounds as though a number of students participated in the survey who are not participating in remote learning. So not really sure how that works. Um, so I hope we can get this you know, written out um, once, obviously I know the survey is still ongoing, so I appreciate, you know, being given a sort of, given an update when we're in, you know, midstream. Um, and I'm also curious, you know, what the, um, you know, what the administrative team sort of concludes and distills down from this data. We can all individually make our own judgments about what we see, um, but I'd be curious you know, in a couple of weeks, once you've had a chance to digest it, to share what, you know, what you see as being meaningful in that, um, you know, seconding Dr. Allison Ampey that, you know, the email is such a pain to not have email, you know, teachers change the times of Google Meets all the time, they move them by 15 or 30 minutes forward or back. And, you know, if you're not looking into that classroom, I mean, my fifth graders have like six Google classrooms on their screen. And if they're not looking at them every day, then, you know, they can miss it. Um, and if they just got email notifications, they could just look in one place and any sort of update or announcement would be there. They would also get notifications if there was feedback on their work. That would be great as opposed to every Tuesday or Wednesday or who knows when going back and opening up every document from the previous week to see if there are comments in the margins because you, there's no way to get a notification on that. My first grader has his own iPad, which is not everybody's experience. And I have managed to get some notifications to pop up on that, which has helped. Um, we miss less for him than for the other kids. Um, and also, so I'm, I'm glad that you're open to looking at that again this summer. I think it really needs to be a serious conversation if we're back in a situation where students are doing, you know, a, a significant proportion of their learning at home. Again, I don't think email is necessary if we can go back to the classroom for elementary school students. We totally agree on that, um, but we don't agree about, about when they're at home. Um, and then finally, you know, I think, um, 
if, you know, if the guidance really is going to push us towards being in some kind of hybrid environment or even a fully remote environment, you know, we, and, and I said this at the first meeting that we had back in March, um, that, you know, that this district and, and this team is reliant on parents like they've never been reliant on parents before because they're who are delivering a lot of the curriculum at home. And so I hope that, you know, there will be a way to, um, to ask opinions. I'm glad that a survey is happening. I hope that, um, you know, that people can participate um, in the conversations that happen this summer. I think people are eager and engaged in a way that they haven't ever been before. They're willing to contribute their time and energy. I think the school councils is a great way to do it. Um, it's a lot easier to have these meetings if they're done over Zoom. People can participate from, you know, if they can actually go on vacation. Um, so I hope that there's a real effort made to do that because I think people are, um, are eager to help. And if we're going to rely on them like we have since March, um, that seems to only be be reasonable um, and fair. So I actually don't I don't have any I don't have any questions. So um, so let's um, move on to um, the summer program plan and um, extended school year ESY. All right, um, I'm going to ask Dr. McNeil to talk about the summer programming plan, and Ms. Elmer can talk about ESY. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Uh, just to check, can everybody hear me? Okay, good, great. So yeah, so one of, one of the things that we wanted to focus on is providing uh, on, um, extended, or if you wanna call it an extended learning program for our students, especially in this environment when we've had the school closure. And so we've, many of the programs are focused on uh, students who uh, normally receive support throughout the school year in math and literacy. And so at the elementary level, we have an expanded elementary summer literacy and math program. And the focus of the program is to provide support and prevent summer regression. The program has been created to invite students to receive reading and math support during the school year. And we've already begun to send out invitations to those students. Also, in addition to that, uh, we are making available the K-5 grids that were sent out uh, during the spring, during the, uh, the, the um, last phase of our remote learning program. Uh, the one, and they include the lessons that are, uh, were focused on moving the curriculum forward. So they will be available. And we're going to, in order for students to access that, we're leaving the Google Classroom open for a large portion of the summer so that the students can access those grids because some of the feedback that we've received from parents is that the students were, you know, elementary students weren't able to complete all of the activities that were located within the grid. So this is a way that students can still access those activities, go back, review the ones that they were able to complete and then um, complete the ones uh, that they did not have time to get to. So at the middle and at the middle school level, we'll be doing the same thing, offering a program that's similar to elementary, where we're going to focus on providing uh, math and reading support. And so that we're in the process of identifying those teachers and developing the program, the math program uh, was just finalized today. I spoke with Mr. Coleman, our director of math. Um, and so the students will, it's, it's a five week program. Uh, it's going to offer uh, a few courses, and it's going to consist of three to ten kids in each one of the uh, in each one of the courses. So that we're trying to keep the uh, particip or we're trying to um, uh, create small group instruction so that we can really support those students who, again, have received that those type of interventions throughout the year. Um, at the high school level. Uh, we're offering uh, an array of different programs. Uh, we're offering MOOCs, um, which is a summer elective course, so that students can basically plan uh, and identify various things that they're interested in, and then they will be able to receive elective credits. Uh, we have a summer credit recovery program um, that will be available to students 
So those students who weren't able to uh, complete some of the classes that get the credits that they need for graduation, they'll have access to a summer credit, credit recovery program. And then we also we will be offering a math program, again, focusing on credit recovery. The courses that will be offered are Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. In addition, uh, we have an English summer credit recover, recovery program. It's live programming, and the courses that will be offered are English uh, classes in, for the ninth and 10th graders and English 11. Uh, and those courses will be five weeks as well. Um, and they're also going to have a credit recovery online program that's going to be offered through Plato. And so the students will be able to, again, uh, uh, receive credits that they may have missed out on for various reasons. And the, looking at the history, science, um, and world language. Oh, world language is not being offered because Plato didn't have an offering that met our, our standards. Um, and then uh, I'll, um, Ms. Elmer will talk about the ESY program. In addition uh, to the online programming that we're offering to students, that will be uh, facilitated by teachers. Uh, we're also going to have online learning tools that we're going to offer to all students in the district. So they will be able to still have a connection to the curriculum. And we will also utilize these online tools to collect formative data that will help us to make those decisions in the fall of what we need to focus on. Uh, in each one of the curriculum areas. So for um, at the elementary level, uh, we we're offering a K-5 Lexia Core 5 reading program. That will begin on August 1st. And then also another reading program we'll be offering is RAS Kids for our kindergarten through sixth grade students. Right now we're trying to um, explore options for secondary students where they can have a source of uh, literary text that they can access online over the summer. And so we need to continue to, um, we're, we're looking for an online program that suits our standards. Um, but we also are going to explore having a partnership with the Robbins Library so that students can check out books. Uh, so we're definitely going to um, work with them in order to do that. And then for math, we're gonna offer Dreambox for our K through six students and then I excel for our students in seventh through 12th grade. And then in addition to the things that we're offering within the district, our EDCO Collaborative is also offering a summer programming that's, that parents can access. And I can uh, put that information onto our district website. And so they can click on the link and they can see what courses are being offered. There's over 150 course options to select from and they will run for eight weeks. And the, uh, the, it is tuition based, um, so parents can uh, sign up and uh, see what courses that they may be interested in for their students. Any questions? No, was, let's, let's do, um, let's group together, um, or do you, let's, do, let's do questions, I guess, on the summer program plan, and then we'll talk about ESY separately because they're very separate. Um, Ms. Exton? Sure. Um, thank you for this update. Um, I'm curious how the students um, that are being offered the summer support were chosen. Um, I mean, are they students that were receiving support in the classroom back in March? Because I just think about how many more students have probably lost some skills from March to now that it's harder to, to know about. So just how were students chosen for this program? Um, That's a great question. So we, we did uh, reach out to our reading specialists. We have math interventionists and we have classroom teachers. So we were we we collaborated with them in order to identify those students who are in most need and who need the most support. So it is. I mean, I can't say that you know we're we're able to, based upon capacity, that we're able to um, provide support for all students who may need it. So I will acknowledge that. But we're trying to identify those students students who have the most need and give them the support over the summer. 
So to your question, um, it, it, we're, we're trying to include as many students as possible because you know, it does require us to have teachers uh, to lead these small groups uh, in instruction. So, you know, as you can imagine over the summer, some of the teachers, you know, based upon the, the amount of work that they had to do in this, uh, during school closure, you know, um, some of the teachers that usually teach in summer program were saying like at this particular point in time, they wanna take a break so that they can recharge their batteries and some other teachers may have like family obligations so um, they can prepare for the fall. So I, I'm very uh, proud of the fact that we have many teachers who did step up to the plate and that we were, we were able to um, serve it. We were able to get these teachers to commit to the summer instruction. And so, I, I mean, we have a, you know, over about a hundred students in each program that we were able to, um, that we're able to uh, service. So I think, you know, we're, we're trying, we tried to build as much capacity as possible. And so that is also a determining factor of how many students we will be able to allow into the program because based upon the teachers who are, who are available over the summer to um, provide instruction. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carden. Thank you. Um, again, I just want to offer a, a suggestion and, um, you know, we, we have supposedly a part-time communications person in the district this, this stuff really, the, the elective stuff is great that we're organizing all that, but you know, uh, and, and maybe Dr. Changer has mentioned it in one of his videos, it, has, it hasn't been out in an email. We really, we really need, you know, an email to parents uh, talking about it. Um, so I, I would and not just slam, put it up on the website. So I definitely would encourage more, more communication always, um, but in particular about this, this summer, which is a special summer, and parents are already desperately looking for options for their kids that so we, uh, we, we get some of this information out. Thanks. Oh, well, absolutely. Oh, I, go ahead. I, I was going to say like, uh, and so to your point, Mr. Cardin, I, I do agree with you 100%. Um, but we, I will say that, you know, many of these programs have just, we've, we've been able to finalize this week, which is a reason why we did not send out a communication just yet. Um, and we thought it would be prudent to begin with the communication here at school committee and then we're going to follow up definitely with a letter out to our parent uh, population to alert them to all the things that we're offering. But I will say that the students that we have identified, we did send out invitations like to students to who are in our Title I program have received invitations, students who are that were identified for some of the programming who are not in Title I. Uh, have received uh, a communication that um, they have this opportunity. So, but we will send out a more general communication because uh, like I said today, the math program at the middle school level was just finalized today and we still need to finalize the details for the literacy program at the middle school level. So I do agree with you and we'll get that out as soon as everything is finalized and we know all the details. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Ampey, can you hear us from your phone? Would you like to ask a question? We'll move on to Mr. Thielman and we can circle back if she comes back on. Thank you. Um, and and uh, Dr. McNeil, thanks uh, very much for this uh, report. I, I agree with Len, we gotta get the word out to people. Um, to, to clarify, um, beyond the, the recovery program, this, all of the programs that are being offered this summer are in Richmond. Are, are they in Richmond or are they <clears throat> designed to help students recover what they might have lost in the final third of the year? Or, I mean, I know it's varied. I know it's K through 12 and I know it's a number of different classes and opportunities. But I mean, how would you, how would you care? If you were communicating this to parents, what would you say to them to get their kids to, to think about taking it? That's a very good question. So yes, uh, the, the programs are to provide students an opportunity to retrieve some of the information they may have missed out on at the credit, those credit recovery programs definitely are geared towards that. Yeah, sure, and credit recovery, and, sure, yeah. And then at the elementary level, we're trying to provide um, intervention and uh, reinforce the skills that some of those students may not have been able to master because of the online, because we did go to remote learning. And so um, to Ms. Exton's point, some of those students, students don't learn as well as they would if they were in the classroom. So those are the students that we know that we needed to focus on and make them a priority because they were already receiving intervention when school was in session. 
And so we know that those students may need additional support because we were in a school closure environment. And so that we wanted to make sure that we were focusing on those students and made them a priority. So I would say skill building, you know, focus on skill building and reinforcing the, the interventions that they receive during the year to prepare them for the fall. I would just, to follow up on uh, what Mr. Cardin said, I, I think it would be good to kind of, you know, um, uh, in the pitch, in the communication, to try to, to, try to use, to have a little bit of a sales pitch, to try to encourage people to sign up for this, because there'll be a lot of people that are going to, a lot of kids and families are just going to be tired of, tired and might not want to do it. And I think it's sort of, you don't want to, you, you got you to gotta thread, a, a, you know, it's, it's going to be careful what you say, because you have to say this is not obligatory, not, not mandatory, but it's going to help you become a better student and be prepared for the fall. Absolutely. And I will say at the elementary level, and this is something that was, you know, you know, you always learn things like through this, this particular situation. But what we found is that we've had more signups, like we more have more kids taking advantage of these situations because we don't have to worry about transportation. Yeah. And so and some some students who normally go to summer camp are not going to summer camp. So we're having an overwhelming response much higher than we have in the past because we're offering it online remotely. And I feel like that's a factor into why we're getting such a positive response to the invitation. So I actually think that in this particular situation, because the summer camps, the kids may not be going to summer camps as they usually do. And then we don't have to, they don't, the parents don't have to worry about the transportation aspect in the summer programming that they're, they're signing up and we're getting a very positive response. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Schlickman. Okay, I just want a very brief uh, description of the budget, how we're paying for this, and if we have uh, extraordinary demand, do we have resources to expand the program? Yeah, so we are taking advantage of the ESSR grant that is because of the COVID situation. And so we have additional monies to pay teachers. Uh, we, we normally, we have a Title I program that we traditionally offer. So we're using that funding for the Title I program, but we were able to offer, extend beyond the Title I program and offer it to our non-Title I schools. We offer summer programming to those students as well who need intervention because of the additional funds. So we, we felt it was necessary in order to invest in this, um, in this uh, offering so that we can support our students. I didn't, I don't know if Dr. Bodie or Michael, Mr. Mason want to add to that budget uh, question as well. And the follow up is, is that it, if we have uh, demand exceeding expectations, can we expand our? We can, again, I go back to the fact that we have to, you know, we have to staff the program as well. So as, as much as our capacity is really um, predicated on the fact that we have the teachers available to teach the programs. Now, some of the online offerings like the Plato. Um, also required uh, teacher um, participation. So our capacity is really, like I said before, predicated on teacher participation. Uh, we're going to circle back to Dr. Allison Ampey. Hi. I'm, hi. I'm in my car. Sorry. Sorry. I'm, it's hard to do. I'm in my car, but not driving anymore. Um, so my question is, uh, this feels like an opportunity for us to take some of these new approaches on a test drive. And I'm hoping that you're going to be setting things up so that you can see what is more effective and perhaps what is less effective um, to help inform what we're doing in the fall. Thank you. I think that's a great point. And that's something that we have been talking about. Uh, like, like Dr. Abodi uh, indicated, I do have two groups at the elementary and the secondary level where we, I call them synchronous instructional study groups. We've had a couple of meetings. We've been sharing best practice. And yes, we've talked about um, being able to utilize the summer programming to um, you know, uh, ex explore different instructional strategies uh, remotely and then report back to the group. So um, that's a great point. And I will also say this, we've made a major invest in on online tools that we would not normally invest in. For instance, Dreambox, we did offer it to students, but in a limited, um, 
in a limited fashion during in previous years. So we've taken this opportunity to expand it to every student. Uh, so some of the online tools or programs um, that we are investing in, uh, we're making a major investment. So when Mr. Schlickman, you talk about what are the things that we have been expanding budget-wise, it's the online tools and the online um, programs that we're offering uh, to students in order to keep them connected to the curriculum and to provide them with academic support uh, when they're not in school. So over the summer, we felt it necessary to do that. Okay, great, thank you, that was all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. Uh, Dr. McNeil, you read my mind. You answered my question right at the end of your comment uh, with the current technology. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I, you know, my only comment, I guess, is is um, you know to continue to make sure that we're communicating this out to parents. I know that you know some parents may be purchasing subscriptions to Dreambox for their children because they don't know if they're available over the summer. Um, just you know that information is not trickling down at the classroom or school level at this point. And I know mm -hmm. we've got one more week left, so um, it's time to really to to really really push that out so people can start to to make their plans and, and figure out what they're gonna do. Um, my only question, um, you know, about the, um, actually I have two questions. So just to clarify for Ms. Exon's question was, were there, have there, well, my interpretation of it, or I guess my question is, have there been new students who have been identified as needing math or reading support since March 13th? And are any of them receiving support this summer? Or are all of the students who are invited to participate this summer students who had already been identified before we left school? Does that make sense? Does that that makes make perfect sense. sense. And, and I, I, I would have to go in to look at the individual students, look at the student list, and be able to uh, identify who those students may be who may not have received support in the past, but we felt it necessary to add them to the list to receive support over the summer. So that's a great question. I can do some research on that and, and do an inquiry and then come back with the information. At the Is your time. sense though that, that that was part of the process of determining who would be offered invitations potentially, that it was, it was sort of to date being, you know, whenever you sent out the invitations, or, or you're just not sure, which is totally reasonable. <laughs> well, uh, kind of both, both okay. and. Like uh, we, we, we pretty much, I put out the call to our curriculum leaders and our coaches and our principals, hey, and uh, to ask what students currently do we feel need support? And in order to further disaggregate that uh, question or that information, I, I can go back and ask the reading specialists and the math interventionists to see if there are new students added to those lists that did not uh, previously receive uh, an, an intervention. Great. So I, would great be, I would be curious to know about that. And I think it would be something that would be would be nice to uh, to share. And um, I assume there was no like we're just not at a place where um, we would the plan is to offer this remotely sort of through du the duration, regardless of what happens if we were to move into phase three. Is that the, the plan is just to do this remotely regardless? Right. Right. Because we want to start planning for the summer and I want to make sure that our plans are definite. And it would be very difficult to plan for like, okay, if the kids are in and, and then there's a lot of logistical things that we would have to consider as well. So I think at this particular point, I want to use the circumstances we have that we know that are that that we're used to um, right now. And unless the state comes out, you know, very quickly and says that, hey, you can have kids come in during the summer. Um, but right for right now, we're planning to offer these programs remotely. And what's the, for the um, elementary programming, what are the dates that you're looking at, roughly? Uh, like, is this July only? Are we looking yes, at July, August? starting in July. Okay, like, starting now, will, in July? Not the end of July, but like the beginning of July. But I will put out the exact dates um, once Great. we have identified, yes. Super, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will include that in the, in the communication that we send out to parents. And, and I, I anticipate, um, and I, I'm gonna ask for, uh, Dr. Bodie's uh, direction on this, that we would send something out next week. Great, and if you guys could potentially consider, you know, forwarding that to us, I think there's a lot of interest in this. Um, so it's it's really it's really good to know about. 
Um, so let's talk about um, ESY. Sure. So um, extended school year is a special ed program for students who have um, that service designated in their IEPs um, and is an accepted service by um, on their last accepted IEP. Uh, so that's just the distinction between these voluntary or, you know, open enrollment programs. Um, so the state has uh, Mr. Hainer alluded to this. The state's guidance has been slow and changing and evolving. Um, and we received the latest guidance specific to summer special ed programs on Sunday evening. Um, and then on Tuesday, there was a webinar um, to go over that guidance and share that there will be additional guidance um, coming out hopefully next week, which will be the full guidance um, on summer programming. And um, there is another meeting tomorrow with the um, senior associate commissioner, Russell Johnson, who is the Johnson, who is the essentially state special ed director. Uh, so the, what we are now being told and what we are, we are planning for is that um, most, we will start remotely with um, plans to have some students come in for some limited in-person services as we progress through the summer. Um, the guidance that rele was released Sunday night is some of the requirements, uh, both the personal protective um, equipment, the uh, protocols and whatnot um, uh, that we would need to follow. So those were released on Sunday. Uh, the ESY coordinators and I met um, following the meeting on Tuesday to discuss how we could roll this out for some limited in-person services as we progress through the summer. Um, state recognizes that most students will receive most of their services remotely this summer, um, but that we should look at what they are considering higher needs students or services that are difficult to deliver remotely. So things like OT and PT. Um, we had already surveyed staff um, to find out who was willing to work in which conditions. Um, not surprisingly, um, there's some who are only willing to work remote, some who are only interested in working in person, and some that are willing to do both formats. We then also um, sent out an initial survey to identified families to find out what, what their thoughts are, where, where their initial thoughts are, and whether they would send their child to um, in-service um, um, or in-person services or whether they would participate um, in the, the various formats. And so we have about a hundred responses so far um, and uh, with about 50, 40 percent saying they would they would send for in-person um, depending on what the protocols are, what the process, the procedures are. Um, so after tomorrow's meeting, to make sure there's no more surprises from the state, um, we'll be sending out a letter to individual families explaining um, what the information we have now, and then um, they will get, after that, individual letters for their student describing what their services are, because they're individual to each student. But in general, the program runs from July 6th through August 13th. It's six weeks. It runs Monday through Thursday from 9 to 12 with some individual exceptions, um, depending again on an individual student. Um, some students may come for just reading, some may come for reading and math. Like I said, it, it's highly individualized. Um, and yeah, that's where we stand right now. Um, normally at this point in the year, we would have had the schedules out. We would have had, you know, people would have been notified about uh, where they're going to be, but given the um, evolving nature of where the state is, um, you know, we're kind of, slowly, you know, following their lead and trying to get information out as quickly as we receive it. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Ms. Exton? Sure. Um, so, I'm just thinking about, again, I know the, um, so the summer services are for students who have already had that um, in their IEP, and I'm just thinking again, similar to um, what Dr. McNeil was talking about, the, the regression has probably been greater than it would have been during the school year. And so is there any consideration, can parents request a meeting 
to qualify for summer services when they might not have typically had the students been going to school every day, um, you know, through June. So the regulations around ESY are not tied to COVID. So there will be a process when we resume schooling um, to consider the impact of on each individual student if a parent requests a meeting um, and determine if compensatory or additional services are required. That is separate from ESY. So there so it's a separate process. Um, ESY is not due to the COVID closure. Um, it is due to, and it's the same process that you would have in the, um, is a student likely to experience substantial regression during this period of time? Now, teachers have been working with the students since um, early May, much longer than we had direct instruction in general education. IEP meetings have been occurring during that time. And so those meetings occur, you, an annual or reevaluation. And at the time of the meeting is when you determine if a student is ready or is eligible for ESY. Um, so it's possible that there were me meetings happening in the spring now where yep. ESY could have been recommended. Yep. Okay. Thank you. But it's not for the result of the, the closure. That's a separate process okay. that all um, special ed eligible students um, will when we resume actual in-person instruction. Thanks. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ms. Elmer, for the update and for the efforts that you're putting towards this. Um, I, I, I applaud you for, for, for moving forward with um, the goal of having some in-person services available for those high priority students. Um, you know, the state standard is that we have to use our best efforts to do that. And um, I, I'm glad to see that we are because I think there are some other districts that are, you know, more or less doing some lip service to this. And um, it's hard, it's a very long list of requirements, but it, it's certainly, um, at least by the end of July, doable. Um, to put that in place, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see some in-person in services for those parents who want it, um, and uh, I applaud you for moving forward with that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? Um, I just want to echo um, Ms. Exton's question that it feels like, I understand that this, the ESY is not because of COVID, but it does feel like there's a chunk of students who are going to have had less progress or even regression over the past couple months because of what the disruption in schooling um, and that I hope that they are considered for help over the summer um, to lessen any further regression or even push them forward a bit. That's all. So that's again. That that's um, separate from what ESY is, which is a well-established part of the regulations. Even during typical times, the goal of the summer program is actually not to as as hard as that sounds to to um, ensure progress. It's to prevent substantial regression. We know all students, um, both general ed and special ed, are going to have experienced regression during this period. The question is, um, is this individual likely to experience substantial regression? Um, due to a break in services, which is not due to the COVID. Now, any of those students may, there may be overlap with the programs that Dr. McNeil um, described. So there are students who may be receiving reading, um, and that happens every summer too. We have students who um, have IEPs who participate in the Title I reading program. So there are other opportunities for those students um, as well that Dr. McNeil mentioned. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Uh, thank you. So, Dr. Elmer, I, I think, you know, I want to echo Len's uh, statement earlier is that I would like, you know, I, I, I hope you try to have as much ESY in person as possible. Do you have a sense of when you, you oh. know what's possible? Um, so one, my, my mother would really love it if I had a doctor, but I don't. So you can just call me Ms. Elmer. But um, my, um, we're we're well, you know, we'll give you a doctorate. Sure, an honorary one. Um, yeah, I've been uh, long, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, we're looking at, as I mentioned, um, some of the individual services like OT and PT that you know are difficult to deliver in a remote format. Again, this is also, you know, we, we're identifying staff who are willing to work in either format. Um, mm -hmm. And we believe we have people who can um, work in both formats. Um, and so those would be uh, an area that we would prioritize. Um, 
likely the uh, SLC program students who receive multiple services, um, those that typically come for the entirety of the morning, you know, that nine to 12 that I mentioned, um, those would be students that we're really trying to get in um, for in-person services. Um, I just want to be upfront, you know, um, likely if you're coming, if you receive math or reading, those would likely be remote for the summer, um, just given what we're, we're being asked to do. A lot's going to depend on how quickly we can get the PPE in and, um, you know, work with Dr. Bodhi and the facilities and um, the local Department of Health to ensure that we have everything in place. There's required training yeah. um, for staff on COVID um, prevention or spread and containment. So they have to participate in that. Um, it's very descriptive, um, the type of equipment needed for the type of personnel. If you're working with students in this type of setting, then you have to have X, Y, and Z. Um, I, I don't think the numbers are an issue for us as far as social distancing. The program is generally smaller. Class sizes are usually eight to 10 anyway um, in ESY. And again, those individual services or small group are usually, you know, one to two or, you know, max four students. So I don't think that's going to be as big a concern for us. Um, but, you know, we met today in the, um, is it our official title, the reopening steering committee, <laughs> which we were talking. Uh, so we have facilities present, we had nursing present. So those are the kind of, that's the kind of work we're going to have to do. Uh, ideally, yes, I would hope, you know, if we could get in even for half of the, the programming, that would be great. I think any in person, I, and I think our teachers would, you know, those would like to be able to do that as well. Well, okay. Thank you. I just want to encourage you to try all you can to make that happen. And I know you are, sounds like you are. So thanks very much. And I'll get your title right one of these days. <laughs> Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, echo the uh, fact that we acknowledge the uh, hard work that's going on behind the scenes here. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. I too want to thank you for the work that you've done. Um, with regard to students actually coming in, would you need more staff to maintain the separation? So Might I, that be an issue? Uh, well, so. so no, I mentioned we have the smaller groups. So the, actually one of the challenges is in order to have student groups, you can, there's only a max of 12 people allowed in a room. So even a group of, you know, eight students, you would only be allowed, you know, four adults. We don't usually have those ratios. So we're, we're looking at eight students and generally two adults, um, you know, maybe in the, uh, preschool program again like this just came out Sunday um, and so we met on Tuesday after we had the webinar with um, the department um, you know the preschool program um, where there is toileting involved where there is you know much closer contact those would be fewer numbers of students but probably higher ratios of staff um, I, I don't think that physical distancing as I mentioned is going to be a, a problem for us I, I'm just concerned as far as uh financing and things of that nature. We want the program to go forward. So you'll have us, my support at least going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I am really happy to hear that, um, that this is what you're working toward. It seems so important. These are students who have been so impacted by not being in our buildings and in our schools. Um, you know, students who receive private outpatient PT and OT, you know, are going back, you know, could have gone back as early as Monday of this week, right? So I think that it's certainly reasonable that if um, that if, you know, if they're able to go to um, private practice appointments, that that's something that, that, you know, that we are striving to be able to do um, here for our students. So it's just, it's really good to hear that that's what you're working to do. Um, and so I'm, you know, I think we should probably have this, you know, I think we should have this on the agenda in two weeks time, just for an update, just because I think, you know, we're really interested. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like we could learn a lot from this experience as well that could be applied toward the fall. Um, and so it, you know, this was a, a really helpful update. So yeah, thank you. I just want to uh, provide one caveat. So currently schools are not allowed to do any in person prior to July 6th on, or until after they receive the final guidance or the full guidance from Commissioner Riley. So that's anticipated next week. Um, 
they've said that before. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that they actually, um, that, you know, I think the date they said was the 17th, um, they were hoping for. So once that comes out, which will, will look more, they have said, will look more detailed, like the EEC guidance that came out a, a week and a half ago, um, the previous weekend. And if you, anyone, looked at that document that's the stuff for the recreation programs the day personal day or private daycares they're they're expecting that theirs will be um compatible with that document so great thank you so much thank you um Ms. so miss moore can i just yes. I, I look back at my notes and i should have included this in my report so i do apologize oh. great we want to hear it now Yes, so sorry. Um, so the elementary program will be five weeks in total, three days a week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That uh, 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 equals out to five weeks. The sessions will be 9 to 12 p.m., um, 35 minute sessions each. Um, and we're going to be able to service four groups a day. So, and, and the dates will be from July 14th to August 13th. And then, and that's the same uh, time for the middle school program, the literacy and the math program uh, at the middle school level as well. And I do want to correct uh, the information about the um, Play-Doh classes that we're offering for students to uh, get credit recovery in various uh, courses such as U.S. History, one and two, modern world history, physical science, biology, and chemistry, um, and those the Plato's will the Plato classes will be offered uh, from June 25th to August 14th, and so those are self-paced, and so uh, students can um, you know can work at their own pace, and and, and that will allow them to um, get the credits that they missed out on. Great, thank you so Hopefully. much. Yeah, so I look back at my notes. Sorry about that. I, I wanted to make sure that that infant. I, I no, no, we've that. got it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, I wanted to make a, a quick note. So, um, I put URI, the Science Camp Alton Jones um, program. This is a, a camp that um, most of our fifth graders, well, my, I have two fifth graders, and this, you know, they went um, in October of this year, and Arlington has typically sent students there. Um, for three, it's usually uh, four days, three nights um, at some point in the fall or early winter of their fifth grade year. And we received notification um, that the camp, due to um, budgetary concerns uh, related to um, the pandemic, as well as concerns at, about, at the university, that the camp would be closing. So, um, Dr. Bodhi, I was wondering if you could just um, provide an update for families acknowledging that. You know, obviously the district is aware of this and, and what you've thought about planning at least moving forward. Unmute. Um, yes, we received the notice today. In fact, it, was, it came the day after we actually had been discussing science camp and wondering if we should put it off to the spring uh, because the, the fall has so many iffiness to it. Uh, but we haven't had much chance yet to talk about this. I, I had actually debated whether to even mention it tonight because we haven't had a chance to send a letter off to the current fourth grade uh, family so they're aware, aware of this. So we are not gonna have science camp and I, this has been a tradition in Arlington for I, I think decades, um, honestly. So one of the things that we have been talking about, in fact, we've been talking about it for a while. It's not, it's not necessarily prompted by this. Uh, there have been a lot of issues um, with access um, and curriculum in the programming there, which at this point is, is not important to talk about, but we're wondering what we, there might be some alternative kind of programming that we could offer for fifth grade students in, the, in science. And so I think this is gonna give us an opportunity um, to take a look at that and we will be looking at it over the summer. At the moment, we don't have any other plans. As I said, what we had been thinking about was whether we'd postpone it to the spring, not uh, necessarily not do it at all. So uh, we will be notifying parents. I, I know it's gonna be very disappointing to the upcoming fourth graders because this is something that they've seen maybe older brothers and sisters go to. 
and were looking forward to it themselves. Um, but like so many things that's happened recently, there's been lots of disappointments and you know, I, I feel, I'm sorry that that's the case for them. But we will be planning something. I don't think it's necessarily going to be an exact equivalent to that. Um, I don't know what this, what other, there are other camps that, that exist in Massachusetts that are similar, different but similar. Uh, and we'll look at those, but as I said, right now it's regrouping and thinking it through. Thank you. Um, does anybody want to speak to this? Mr. Cardin, I see you. Anybody else? Okay, so Mr. Cardin. Hi, thank you. Yes, I'd actually like to make a motion. Um, I move that the chair is, is directed to write a letter to URI uh, expressing our disappointment at the closure and requesting reconsideration in light of the special relationship that Arlington has had with the Alton Jones camp. Second that. Oh. And and just to speak to that, speak to it. I mean, it it, it was a very sudden decision. Uh, who knows whether there's any chance to reverse it or not, but. Um, certainly as a major uh, partner with Alton Jones, um, you know, I think we should express our, our um, you know, dismay and disappointment at this decision. Um, you know, according to the camp, they actually, they weren't having financial difficulties, so who knows, but, um, you know, I, I think it's important to go on record that this is a, a disappointment to us. Great, so I have a um, motion by Mr. Cardin, seconded by uh, Mr. Hayner. Uh, discussion, Dr. Allison Ampey. I'm glad Mr. Cardin made that motion because I was hoping to do something similar. Um, I think it is important to put our voices out there. I also want to make it clear to parents that they can, uh, there's information I think on the Alton Jones website and definitely on social media um, for them to directly email um, Alton Jones and URI and um, make their voices heard in terms of keeping this. It, it's a resource which is not just for Rhode Island. It's clearly, it's major in Massachusetts. It's been a great thing for our kids, both for science camp and also many kids go there for summer um, camps and it, it's a really good program. Great. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yeah, I uh, want uh, thank Mr. Cardin for making this motion and uh, <clears throat> I wholeheartedly support it too. I've, I've actually been uh, at science camp twice uh, overnight. So uh, with my older children, so uh, my rising fifth grader won't have the experience, unfortunately, unless, but, but maybe this motion will prod the camp to uh, reconsider, think it through and get back to us. So I am thankful to Len for putting this forward. And I think it's a loss for another, just one example of another loss for our kids. Thanks. Okay, anybody else? So let's do a roll call vote to direct me to write this letter. Um, so Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes, and I'm happy to help write it. I, I, I don't doubt that. <laughs> Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. And I too am yes. So that is a seven nothing vote and we will get on that pronto. Um, moving on, the 2020-2021 Arlington Public Schools calendar uh, first read. Dr. Bodie. This is uh, an updated calendar. If you recall back in January, we've been doing it this way for a while. Uh, we take a look at what the first day of school is going to be, look major vacations so the parents know exactly um, what, the, the, what the main uh, vacations and start dates are. But as we move further along, what we want to do is to take a look um, at, with a lot of consultation uh, of what the early release days are going to be, as well as the conference dates uh, for next year. And so so basically what you're seeing here in this first read um, are the identified conference dates, both afternoon dates as well as evening. The one thing I will say though, it, it may seem like the high school may not have that many, it's because of the way they're structuring uh, conferences 
through um, the schedule, the X block that they have in the schedule. But um, this is a pretty much a complete, uh, I don't know, honestly, if how any of this might potentially change next year. That's something that we'd have to consider. But uh, this is just simply a first read of the calendar and then the expectation is that we would vote it at the next meeting. I don't know if anybody has any questions about it. Yeah, so I see that uh, I see Mr. Hayner has questions. Anybody else? Ms. Exton, anybody else? The doctor, okay, let's just start from the top or the bottom, however you wanna look at it. All right, Ms. Exton. Um, and I, I'm sorry if I missed this from a previous uh, um, piece, but um, in the past, the kindergarten got out with everyone. Then last year and this year, they were getting out early. And then this calendar has them getting out on the same last day as everyone else. Are, are you going back to that? Um, we're, we're, the, the truth is we haven't really decided what to do. Um, I think that that is, I'm glad you pointed that out. Cause that is one thing that is not in here. And I'm aware of that because we don't know. Um, so we may need to come back to you in the fall as things get more de um, definite as to how we're going to, to do that. The reason why the kindergarten had, had gotten out last year earlier is that that's when we did the screenings. And I think everyone who in this change in model going from the fall to June, people prefer that. But I don't know if that's what we will do going forward. I would just, I think because it's such an inconvenience to families, especially if at that point we're back at school full time to have that change in their, the kindergartner schedule that families know that that's gonna be a change from the older students or if they're new to the district. Um, so just being aware that we need to be really clear about that, that dismissal date for kindergartners. Are you suggesting that we deal with that very early on in the school year as to whether we're going to do the screening next year in June? I agree with you. I, I certainly don't want this to be a surprise to parents in January. Um, Mr. Cardin, did you have anything? Uh, no, thanks. Uh, Dr. Alice Nampi? I just wanted to clarify. So this calendar is kind of what we expect, but we're still waiting on a whole bunch of guidance from DESE and that may affect the calendar. So if it does, we'll then update it. Right. right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thielman? No. Uh, Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I, I see that holiday in September has been removed. Uh, Thanks for uh, putting this together. Mr. Hainer. Uh, I assume since we've become so skillful in remote learning, we really don't need snow days. <laughs> I'm just making a quip out of it. I don't even know if they're qualified. My grandson was very upset. He says there'll never be another snow day. Um, so I guess, you know, just, I wanna, I wanna, I hope that we can do, you know, sort out the kindergarten end date as soon as possible. Um, I appreciate it feels a little silly to be approving this calendar, but it's something we need to do. And uh, it's just, it's part of our best efforts to just keep moving forward. So, um, so I don't have any questions and we'll um, do the second read and the vote next. Next. Yep. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the FY21 school budget for town meeting. Um, let me just give a quick overview and then I'm ask Mr. Mason to talk about this. Um, we went to the finance committee and thank you for those of you that attended as well. And the, the finance committee did vote that the school budget would be reduced by 10% of the increase, not 10% of the whole budget, just 10% of the increase we would have had next year. And what that translates into is that it would be $460 million, which 
thousand. Uh, four hundred sixty. Four hundred six. No. Four hundred sixty thousand thousand dollars, which translates into a number of positions um, that were identified for finance committee. But I think it's something that we need to have some more discussion about and ask for a budget subcommittee sometime toward the end of next week where we can have some more discussion about that. Um, but right now we have, we have a finance committee meet, um, a town meeting on Monday evening. It is, it's going to be an in-person. And at that time, uh, the town meeting is going to vote on the budgets, but before they can vote on the budget, it's important that you uh, approve the revised budget from the budget that you had approved in March. And I don't know if Mr. Mason wants to talk a little bit about some of the particulars of this. Yeah, so um, in the memo, um, the, I, I was trying to basically uh, communicate to the school committee two things. A, the first thing is what we s submitted to the finance committee. Um, excuse me, my daughter. Comment if I'm not sure if everybody heard that, but um, so the 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 figures um, shown is what's reported to the fin the finance committee, um, and is not the exactly the same as what we uh, propose or put in the school committee report or, or budget, um, as there are six segments compared to the seven, and the segments are actually shown differently. Um, are displayed differently as instruction lumps in secondary and elementary education as one where in our reports we actually have it separated out and it separates out special education in the two different categories. Um, the, the other part is uh, the, the updated charts that we had in the, the, the budget book that was previously presented are, are, are also are included in this memo. Um, which these updates included some the proposed adjustments uh, that we made, but the, that that's you'll see on page three of the memo, which actually have been slightly adjusted. Uh, we we haven't actually sat down with the budget sub subcommittee yet, but this is what you know we wanted to uh, fully propose, uh, where we can kind of go through what um, what the adjustments are. I can kind of briefly tell you, I'm just trying to pull up on my side over here. And the, the, on page three, you'll notice that um, the, we had reduced line 33, um, which is a reduction of out-of-district tuition by an additional 40,000 uh, to be able to uh, accommodate a much needed physical therapy assistant. Um, and we, we feel strongly that we'll be able to reduce the special education uh, out of district tuition by this amount based on some of the decisions that we're doing this year in the current budget, which a final plan will be presented to the budget subcommittee, which then will later on be presented to the full body school committee. In regards to how we want to handle special education out of district tuition um, and, and any prepayments that we may, may do um, and any transfers that we may need to do uh, for the end of the year. Um, so tonight, this I would like the school committee to, uh, in order for the town for it to be a, uh, to be allowed to be voted at the town meeting, is to move to accept the, the revised FY21 town appropriation in the amount of seventy five million five hundred and seventy thousand five hundred thirty one dollars, based on the the seven categories, um, that uh, or the six categories that are for the town appropriation, and then vote on the budget transfer summary for the total budget uh, for, the, for the school committee um, that, has, that includes the grants amounts. Uh, any questions, I, I'm here to answer any. Mr. Hainer? You're on mute, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. On the document that you presented to us, uh, on, it says uh, at the elementary, secondary, and special education, uh, it amounts to about 455,000. Are any of those current positions or are those anticipated positions and expenses? Mr. Hainer? 
I'm sorry, what did, I don't know what chart you're referring to when you're saying 455,000. We were given a document that was titled uh, School Committee Matters, let's see, from you, dated June 11th, yep. Finance, Finance Committee on the second page, there is a chart that says town appropriations and it, it shows cuts of 117,500 oh, elementary. You're referring, so that's, that's, that's the cuts that we are proposing that's based on the third page. Um, All right, I just want to clarify. The, yes. uh, are the, none of those are current positions, am I correct? No, no, so that's $460,000 reduced from the, the original budget that we proposed that the school committee has already approved. I understand. I just want to clarify that they, these are additional positions going, Correct. they would have been additional positions or expenses added uh, funding for the programs. Am I correct? correct? These were additional positions that we have to remove now due to this reduction. Correct. So they, they, they don't represent any current staff that we have? They're not representing a layoff of any matter or. Oh. Um, Thank you very much. Of staffing. Any other questions? Mr. Schlickman. Okay, the, uh, Mr. Hainer asked my predominant question. The, the other question is, uh, I, I see that we're, we're eliminating reserve teaching positions. I'd just like to have uh, a brief comment from either Mr. Mason or Dr. Bodie as to uh, what the prospects are for uh, uh, dealing with any surprises in enrollment, or if uh, we, we think we're pretty settled? Um, I don't think that we're pretty settled yet. Um, what we had on this proposal to the, the Finance Committee, uh, we, we needed to identify for them what the $460,000 would be. We had two reserve positions. At the moment, we know we're hiring an additional teacher at Pierce because kindergarten enrollment is such that we're going to need another, another section in kindergarten. Actually, what we'll be hiring for is for uh, um, the, the next grade, uh, grade three, that the, the group of three just keeps rolling through the school. Um, it's not clear yet whether we're going to need another reserve position, and if we do, then this relates to what, how else would we um, handle that if we've identified two reserve positions. But I think that's something I would like to have a little bit more in-depth discussion with the Finance Committee, and it does relate uh, to the tuition uh, prepayments that we would make for next year from FY20 funds. So at the moment we have only one, but I see some potential for another one and we're gonna to have to address that uh, and also this, also this list. Okay, thank you. That's, uh, you know, th that's just something that has been really difficult for us over the past few years and I just. Yeah, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree, I agree. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to point out for the you know community that Arlington has a bit of good news thanks to our partnership with the town and the override that we did pass that we aren't we aren't having to lay off teachers or any staff for that matter as it now stands. Um, things can change, of course, but uh, as of now, we are not laying anybody off. Um, we actually are able to hire a couple of new positions where they're sorely needed due to enroll our enrollment increase, um, and this is thanks to our long-term partnership with the town. Um, so what we're voting for tonight is to accept a reduction. Um, it's a reduction in our increase, and therefore it doesn't result in any uh, teachers losing their jobs or staff losing their jobs at this point in time. So I'll, I'll go ahead and make the motion if you want, Chair, Madam Chair. Please. Um, let me flip over to that. Um, I move that uh, the... Oops. I move that the school committee accepts the revised FY9 town appropriation in the amount of 75,575,31 and vote the revised FY21 school committee budget transfer summary as presented in the attachment. I'll second the motion. Uh, great, so um, roll call vote, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. 
Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Hayner? Yes. Mr. Yes. Morgan, me, myself, I'm also a yes, so that's a seven nothing. Um, moving forward, that was all you needed from us, Dr. Bodie, right? Just with just approval, just budget approval. Yeah. That's correct. Right. Thank you. Um, so moving on to, um, to detentions, I put this on the agenda because um, I was curious about how we are um, thinking about and looking at detentions and um, I expect this to be a, probably a two-part piece with a, a brief update tonight and then some more information in, um, in two weeks time. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bodhi for a um, for a, sort of an opening about this and then with the expectation that we're going to learn more in a couple of weeks. Um, that's correct. We, were, we will give a more updated um, re uh, report on this in two weeks. Uh, the, over the last year, we've been giving monthly reports to principals. And one of the parts of that report are the number of detentions. Um, so I actually, this is something I work very closely with uh, Dr. McNeil on, and he's going to talk a, a sort of an overview of where we are with this, uh, the data mining on this. And then as, I, as you pointed out, we're gonna have a more complete ex, uh, presentation in two weeks. Dr. McNeil? Yeah, so I, I, I hope I wanna uh, ask the committee to Pardon me, I did prepare a statement on discipline because I know it has been a uh, issue since uh, in the last couple of weeks and then based upon the requests for the detentions. Um, we want to make sure that we are working towards providing a very comprehensive report as it relates to the, deten the, de the detentions. Um, we have worked very hard, like, um, and I, I can acknowledge, acknowledge this, that we've had many discussions regarding discipline uh, that the secondary building administrators and also the uh, elementary building administrators uh, do a very good job of looking at the discipline reports that we send out monthly. Um, they have to sign them um, and then they identify uh, various students who may have multiple offenses and try to work with them in order to support them with the behavioral challenges that they're presenting. Um, some of the strategies we've talked about in the past at the high school, the collaborative problem solving, um, we've done a, a work at the district level and with staff with working on implicit bias. And we know that we have a disproportionate number of, or, of students who are of the African American and other subgroups who receive discipline. So in, in being able to uh, have the appropriate amount of time um, I spoke with Dr. Bodie and uh, in order for us to put together a more comprehensive report, I would like to um, just ask this committee if they could uh, submit some questions um, specifically as it relates to detentions and any other questions as it relates to discipline to me. And uh, what I plan to do is work with the secondary and elementary building administrators to prepare a very comprehensive comprehensive report and that we can present in the next two weeks and I'm going to ask them to come along with me and so they can individually talk about not only the the detention work the work that they're doing in order to um, address uh, students who receive detentions but other uh, discipline aspects as well that may have that may come up in that in that discussion so um, I think that that will provide us with the direction of the, the questions that this committee submits will help us to provide us with direction and be able to format the presentation. So we're giving you the information uh, that you need um, and that the community needs. So I'm just gonna end my remarks right there and then ask any uh, questions or comments to what I just said. Great, thank you, Dr. McNeil. So I guess what I would ask, um, and we can do questions and comments too, if people have things that they wanna say on this, would be to, um, you know, to get your questions to Dr. McNeil as, um, I guess, uh, just as quickly as possible so that his team has as much time um, as possible to, you know, to think about this and do so in a really, um, you know, thorough 
way. So if, if you can get them to him by Tuesday or when, well, let's say Wednesday of next week seems, does that seem reasonable, Dr. McNeil? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I'd like to give you guys more than a full week. So let's say Tuesday, right? Because we're Thursday now. So Tuesday of next week um, yeah. so that he has that. Um, and um, and then it'll be on the agenda for our next meeting. So um, questions now on this topic? Mm -hmm. Seeing none. No, no question. All right, nobody's waving frantically. Okay, um, great. Does that, does that help you, Dr. McNeil? Do you feel set with where you're at now? And then we'll, you'll hear from us um, by Tuesday and then we'll go from there. That, that's, 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 that sounds great. And I think that will give us the, the direction that we need. And uh, like I said before, we'll be able to pre present the data in a very organized manner and, and respond to, by responding to those questions. Great. Super. Okay. Um, and if you don't hear from people, you can let me know. And we'll I will. <laughs> shake the tree a little bit. Absolutely. See what falls out. Um, okay. Uh, so the next item is a COVID-19 funding resolution um, that I am going to uh, defer to Mr. Schlickman on this. He brought it to my attention through um, his uh, engagement with and work with um, MASC. So I'm going to let him um, go ahead and, uh, and share this with all of you. Yeah, I, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this resolution is circulating on the um, uh, MASC listserv, and uh, it originated, I think, in Amherst Pelham, and a group of uh, school committees out in that neck of the woods has uh, drafted the resolution. Uh, the purpose is, is that at this point, uh, you know, funding for any additional costs particularly related to uh, the opening of uh, school, the COVID uh, materials that uh, the state is mandating, um, may be promised, may be discussed, uh, isn't firm. And uh, uh, in talking to Mr. Kucher, he said, you know, it can't hurt to pass this just to send the message and uh, as one of many school committees were saying that, that we do have a uh, concern that uh, the, the additional costs of running a school system directly related to the COVID pandemic uh, needs to be reimbursed somehow because we just don't have the resources to add extra burdens. So that's, that's the reason why the uh, resolution is brought forth before us. And I think that Dr. Allison Ampey uh, also flagged this as something we should talk about. So I'd like to pass it on to her with the chair's permission. Sounds good to me. Dr. Allison Ampey. So um, I echo what Mr. Schlickman said. Um, I think this is an important motion. I actually feel it's more important for the state than it is for our particular district. I think we're lucky that we have our partnership with the town and our funding is somewhat more stable than many that I'm hearing about but I'm especially concerned about what's gonna be happening with the gateway cities and with other school districts, which are much more dependent on state funding and don't have any extra resources to handle an emergency like this. So um, I, you know, yes, I would like us to see benefit too, but um, part of the reason I feel we should be sending this forward is, is thinking of many of the other children in our state, not just our district. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mason or Dr. Bodie, would you like to talk about how um, we're handling the um, funding around this here in Arlington, which to Dr. Allison Ampey's point may be a little different than in other communities? Um, yes, I'm going to let Mr. Mason talk about this, uh, though we all work on it very closely, because he is the person in the district um, that keeps track of all of our COVID-19 related costs. And he can talk uh, about what that process has been and what will the process is going forward. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'd like to echo, yeah, we've had, we do have a great 
collaborative relationship with the town and you know part of the planning process you know uh for just in terms of the long range planning committee we had set up a plan in terms of what we were intending to try to contribute back and one of the things uh in our process was that you know there are a lot of things that we do have to purchase to prepare for next year and um it's tallying up pretty quickly um when we had an initial deadline to submit for the CARES emergency relief funds, um, uh, and we did so collaboratively with the town, and that was for expenses that would date back uh, from the start of uh, COVID. Well, actually back in March, this is when the state of emergency started. And uh, we, were, we were able to claim uh, about $125,000 a little bit over that uh, we submitted for COVID-19 related expenditures. Um, so this is great for the taxpayers in the town of Arlington in the sense of that the community will at least uh, uh, will can get up to that amount. We're not sure uh, in terms of if we're going to get all of those funds reimbursed back, but we're submitting as much as we can that are related to COVID. And um, those, those majority of those expenses were technology related. Uh, but the, the unfortunate thing is that um, it's not necessarily means that we will see it in our, our future budget. So, um, but that was something that we knew we, we, what we were doing in terms of that. And this is what we were kind of seeing as what our remaining funds for the year would be giving back to the, to the, to, to the town. Um, going forward, uh, we will uh, also su submit funds as we anticipate them or as they come. So currently we're at over $1.1 million worth of expenditures, including that first claim. And uh, with some additional expenses that we're working through, uh, at the end of the year, it could go even higher than that. And so we will then put a claim in again uh, for funds, but that would go to the emergency relief fund and uh, we're not sure how it will be dispersed going forward, depending on what we get reimbursed and when the timing of that reimbursement happens. So that's that's where we stand right now. And uh, that's all I can comment on for the moment uh, because the, you know, we don't even know what the full reimbursement is going to be. Thank you. So is there a motion related to this resolution? Mr. Schuchman? Yeah, I move, I move we adopt the resolution uh, and send it to the people uh, listed on, on the resolution. Second that. So a uh, motion by Mr. Schlickman, second by Mr. Hayner. I think he slid in before you, Dr. Allison Ampey, um, to adopt the resolution as, um, as you have it in your packet. Um, so roll call vote, Ms. Exton? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cardin is not here. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schuchman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I'm also a yes. So that's a six nothing vote. Um, superintendent's report, Dr. Bodie. Um, I just want to report on the high school. There's actually not a lot to report other than uh, you can, if you've been around the school, you can see how much already is happening in terms of the grading of the front. Uh, the back has had um, the parking lots laid out. So most of the parking as we go forward with construction is going to be at the back of the school. We've had to put, uh, use the basketball court and then extend beyond that. Um, and those of you will be at town meeting on Monday night, you'll get to see uh, those parking lots as well as there's a new parking lot over on the practice field. But the project's going along. Um, we've been able to accelerate the construction that's necessary for a new entrance next year um, in, um, and, and the renovation that needs to happen in Downs for main office to be there guidance and the nurse's office. So that's all 
moving along quite well. At this moment, Parmeter remains on schedule. Uh, and so we expect um, to be able to occupy that building sometime in late August. So all going, all going well. Um, and uh, I might add, it's always nice to say, on budget, on time and on budget. Uh, another, uh, I want to bring up the kindergarten enrollment. You have this in the uh, in Novus. Uh, taking a look at where we are right now, it's um, a little bit behind where we were last year at this time. But we right now we definitely have um, 441 uh, confirmed applications that all of the materials that are necessary to have turned in to have been completed. But we also have uh, some pending ones of another close to 40, 39. So we are at this point, um, at the end of June, behind where we would have expected to be. So I don't know if it's the, you know, does everyone has just, uh, it's not been a focus for them over the last uh, uh, three months. So we'll see where we are. It's. Um, you can see where the numbers are. And as I mentioned earlier tonight, uh, Pierce is going to now definitely need a third kindergarten now for the uh, third year in a row. And with the pending number that is there, we're definitely over sort of the number we usually have as the, the turning point, which is at 60. There are also, there's also the possibility that we'll just have to wait and see the Stratton may need to go to a fourth kindergarten, but that remaining remains to be seen at this point. But otherwise, um, our prediction, and I mentioned this before in another meeting that it was, I think, 530 students. So if, if there are a lot of parents that are deciding, just given the uncertainty of next year, deciding to um, keep their children uh, out one more year, I think what we're going to see the following year, if this trend continues, is our very large kindergarten classes in FY22. So we're, we're watching the numbers um, and we will continue to watch the numbers as we always do um, all summer and just to, to make sure that we have the, um, uh, the, the, class, the classes that we need for our incoming kindergarten classes. Does anyone have any question on kindergarten numbers? If not, the, the last thing I'll bring up in the superintendent's report is the last meeting we talked about um, the EDCO situation with its budget and the um, motion by the town of, Lex or the town of Lexington uh, to begin, the, to begin uh, the process of termination for EDCO. We had a board meeting uh, and Lexington withdrew that motion and there was no other submission of a similar motion. Uh, just, uh, Belmont, which had considered withdrawing, has rescinded that withdrawal as well. And the other two districts, um, the Concord Carlisle one and Lexington, have left open the door that they may modify their, uh, their position on on withdrawal next year, but at the moment um, are planning to do so the following year. So that's good news. And I think that one of the things that came out of the board meeting was very strong support of the direction that, that EDCO is moving, uh, strong support for the administration at, at EDCO. And um, at the moment, um, there, there is a budget that has been proposed that is to the positive, and we're working on a three-year strategic plan, which, well, which we will share with you when that's developed. So it's all, it's all good news. And, and at some point, maybe we'll have a chance to celebrate its 50 years of being a very strong and um, a viable and supportive organization that has been uh, in this next year. And that's my report. Great, thank you, Dr. Modi. Um, questions, I saw Dr. Allison Ampey had her hand up. Anybody else? So Dr. Allison Ampey? Um, I just wanted to say about the kindergarten students that I think it would help if we could get more information to the parents um, of students who are, have already signed up 
um, just because they're talking about how they don't know anything about what's going on and that's not encouraging to anyone who hasn't yet signed up. Um, and so communication with these families about what's planned or what, you know, how you're, how you're approaching things, um, I think is important and, and will help maybe shake some more people out. Well, I'm, I'm not, are you suggesting following up with the current the, pendings or the ones that we currently have approved? The current one, the ones who are already signed up. Yeah, the, the ones that are already signed up, we're having virtual meetings at all of the elementary schools. Um, over already, I think three or four of them already have happened and more are happening next week. So that all of these families have been invited to a virtual meeting and all of these families have received uh, written documents from the schools about the expectations. Uh, the, the families, I thought you were referring to the ones who are pending because the ones that are pending uh, were not invited to um, the virtual meetings, but once they have completed the application, we certainly are going to reach out to them. I actually thought you were also thinking about, are there families that just haven't gotten around to registering and how we can reach out to them? What, what's happening at each elementary school, and this, this happens actually every year, is that we, we know who the current families in that school who has a, a child that would be eligible for kindergarten this year and the, the school assistants, uh, school secretaries are reaching out to them to see if they're planning to, to register the students. As far as people in the town who are not in this pool of people, um, it's be very hard to identify all of those people that we, we need to perhaps reach out to this summer. We can get some of that information as we always have in the past from the town clerk and to the extent that we can, we will. Yeah, I, we hadn't been informed about the meetings last at, at our last meeting. And so that's great. It, it, it's when people are um, talking among themselves and saying, well, I haven't heard any, you know, I signed up my kid, but I haven't heard anything. I have no idea what's going on with school. If their friend hasn't already signed up, it does not, make them feel like, oh, I should go sign up now. Um, so if we're having meetings and getting information out, that's really helpful, thank you. Great, anybody else besides me? I just, I, I just can't help but comment on the kindergarten numbers. I think the thing that's striking to me is that we have 76 confirmed at Thompson with 10 pending. Um, that makes me a little anxious <laughs> uh, because that's a really big number in mid-June, potentially. Um, and then just a really like sort of surprisingly low number at bracket right mm -hmm. now. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I trust that and, and, you know, we get the buffer zone report every year in the fall in hindsight. And, um, you know, I know that uh, your office, Dr. Bodie, is working really hard to make these you know, make sensible choices. Um, I think, you know, by this point in the year, the buffer choices become pretty clear. You know, they're much more obvious. Like at some point you have to sort of put a stake in the ground and decide the route you're gonna go based on what what you see happening. And now it's sort of executing on that, um, on that plan. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. It's so hard to know right now if people are holding back, if they're gonna hold back like really hold back, hold back, or if they're just holding back right now, um, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, we'll find out, but it's, it's one of the great, uh, it's one of the great, it's one of the incredible things about public schools and it's one of the biggest challenges. So um, thank you for giving us these numbers. I think they're really helpful to see. I think it's important that they're um, available. So thank you very much for that. Um, the next agenda item um, is everybody's favorite topic, how many times we're going to meet in the summer. Uh, I think normally, you know, I think last summer, I think we actually, we met at the end of June and then we didn't meet again until we came back in September, except in some subcommittees. 
uh, I don't see the summer of 2020 looking like that. <laughs> so I think there's just so much uncertainty and unknown. So uh, what I proposed was to, well, one of my proposals, or I would need one of you to adopt my initial suggestion was to put four dates on the calendar, which would roughly uh, keep going with our sort of every other week. We would have a couple of uh, increments of three weeks in there, um, put four dates on the calendar with the option to cancel uh, one, two, or more of them. Um, but I, I just think it's easier to um, have them out there than try to scramble. Um, and my sense is, is that we're still gonna be able to meet remotely so you know if people are not in Arlington we should still be able to um, at least get a quorum so that we can can meet and get an update on the fall so uh, discussion about uh, summer meeting Mr. Hainer. I support uh, the four meetings thank you any other discussion so I don't even know what we need to do to put these on the calendar. So can somebody tell Mr. me? Uh, Mr. Chair. Schlickman, tell me. I move that the Arlington School Committee schedule special meetings for July 9th, July 23rd, August 6th, and August 20th, 2020. I'll, I'll second the motion. <clears throat> All right. Roll call. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin is not here. I'm looking for his box. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. And I am also yes. So that is a six nothing vote. Mr. Cardin, we're voting on the four additional school committee meetings for the summer. Would you like to vote or would you like to abstain? I'll just abstain. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right, uh, consent agenda. All items, this is funny to me because there is no asterisk, but so I feel weird reading it. So the items listed below that I am going to read are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 20292, total warrant amount $411,089.69, dated 6-2-2020. Approval of minutes, May 14th, 2020 and May 28th, 2020, school committee Zoom meeting minutes. So move. Second. Um, Roll call vote. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I'm also yes. It's a seven nothing vote. Um, the last item, we are almost caught up to actual real time. It's been a miracle. Uh, planning for stakeholder input and development program materials with MASC. Um, superintendent search process subcommittee recommendation. I did not put this on the agenda, so I am assuming that this is something that came to us from Mr. Schlickman. Um, so I'm going to call on him. Okay, the search process subcommittee met twice uh, last week uh, to talk about process. Uh, Glenn Kucher said that uh, MASC will do as many focus groups as necessary. Uh, and we've been working through identifying groups we should invite for a focus group. Uh, we also prepared a s online survey. He told me today that uh, they were getting about 800 responses out of Quincy on their survey. What we did is we looked at a bunch of different surveys from different communities, uh, decided what format we wanted, what uh, statements we wanted on them, and how to guide them and the proposed survey was pushed back to us. We looked at it, made corrections, um, uh, sought advice, and uh, it's ready to rock and roll. We'll need to uh, get the uh, school department to uh, make connections with, uh, with parents, and we'll put the survey out uh, to the entire community. Uh, uh, as soon as we uh, as soon as we can, which could be uh, 
um, tomorrow. Any discussion? I just have a um, thank you for that report. My my question is, is it? Po I'm, I'm wondering if we can use. So at some point in this in this whole process, the, the school committee is going to meet and talk about and do, our, do our focus group with uh, Glenn. Um, and I'm wondering if we can just uh, use one of those four meetings this summer to do it. It's a suggestion. Yeah, we can tie it into one of the regular meetings. We we can do it whenever we want. I I, I want to say that uh, Rieko was volunteered to translate so we can do a Japanese language focus group. Uh, from what I also understand that uh, we have uh, AEA starting, ha has started focus groups. Uh, I think they were scheduled to start focus groups with the teachers today and we want to get notice out to the parents before school ends uh, so that they, they're aware of focus groups uh, before they uh, uh, before they uh, adjourn for the summer. Okay, so back to my question. <laughs> I I just think I just think it'd be good as we get a schedule, Paul, to <clears throat> um, pick a date, July or August, in which we so we can also see who's going to be here to make sure we have attendance for everybody, so we can do our focus group. Uh, that's Great. A, I just want to be because there some of those dates, the August dates I voted for, the one might might be a problem, but we'll see. All right, um, thank you. Oh, Ms. Exton. Um, I was glad to hear Paul say that about translating a focus group. Is it possible for the survey to be translated? Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll have to get a translation up and then, uh, gen generally speaking, what they've done is they've translated through uh, uh, Google Translate, which isn't always the best, but at least it gets it there. Uh, if we can also get it, uh, have Rieko look at the Japanese transla uh, translation. She's a wonderful volunteer. Uh, uh, hi, honey. I just volunteered you for some more work. Um, well, I mean, I would want it. I would want to know what are the most spoken languages in APS and make sure that it was, you know, in some way available translated into those languages. Because um, I think even though students coming to school might be speaking English, uh, their home language may not be able to read a survey in English. So. We're required to record home language parents in our student management sy uh, system so we can get a count and then look, see what we could do strategically on other languages. Thank you. All right. Mr. Hainer. Uh, Paul, should MASC have that available? as part of the program? I have, have which available, the translations? The ability to, if we st state to them that we need X amount of translations uh, from uh, what we know in the system, what's ne needed, that they provide it. Yeah, they'll, they'll go and do that. Uh, they'll probably use an electronic translation service, uh, which for European languages really isn't problematic. It gets a little dicier on Asian languages. That's so, we'll probably help out there for how we can. I think that the two or three top languages in the district are, are Asian. I know the Japanese traditionally has been the number one. Any other comments or questions on this topic? Let me just welcome Mr. Cardin to the subcommittee and uh, we're going to be very busy over the next few weeks. Great. Um, so, subcommittee and liaison reports, budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Budget will be meeting next week. Don't know when yet. Okay. Uh, community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, the school committee has five appointments to the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Two of them are coming due this year. So, uh, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald will be sending out an announcement seeking applications. The due date for applications to be turned back to Ms. Fitzgerald is June 19th. Community Relations Subcommittee will be meeting at 6 p.m. on June 23rd to review the applications and hopefully we'll have recommendations for the full, commi full committee on June 25th. Okay, uh, and you'll connect with us if that's where you're at to make sure it's on the agenda. Absolutely. Should we put it on the agenda for that night? Regard well, we'll we'll talk I, about that offline. I, I I think 
put it on the agenda. If there's a glitch, I'll report on the glitch, but I'm not, hopefully there won't be any glitches. Okay. Um, CIA, Mr. Cardin. Uh, nothing to report. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. You're on mute, sir. Nothing to, re nothing to report. Bill has uh, given me all this uh, guidance and uh, all this information from his years as chair. So I'm going to read that and get ready. Yes, I'd like to know. We had, we had, a, we had some musical chair personships uh, in this cycle, just given uh, changing uh, committee membership, et cetera. So a lot of these people were elected chair about uh, three hours ago. So uh, policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, no report. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman, or Dr. Allison Ampey. I mean, Dr. Bode gave a they gave the full report. We're you've got everything you need. Um, and we heard from the superintendent search process. Did you have anything else, Mr. Schlickman? Uh, no, nothing further. Okay. Uh, I see we have the calendar committee and the election modernization committee. I will look into uh, that situation. Um, and then uh, liaison reports. No. Uh, announcements. No. Future agenda items. Here we go. We're getting close. Uh, that's it. All right. Um, do we need to do executive session tonight? No, I can't even find Mr. Spiegel. Where is No, Mr. we don't. Um, Thank you. It's, nothing's listed on the agenda anyway, so. No. Don't. Okay. Great. So. Mr. Ha Mr. Hainer. I'd just like to make a comment. We've uh, somehow managed to finish not only on time, but before what the agenda calls for. So now you have to maintain this the rest of the year, Ms. Morgan. I think this was just lucky, but let's go ahead and adjourn so that we can, we can put 25 minutes in the bank for later down the road. So I need a motion for that. A motion to adjourn. Thank you. We Second. Great. Roll call vote. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Thank Sorry. you, sir. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hayner. Yes. And I am also a yes. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you, you, team. Be, be safe. Bye. Thank you.